For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Samantha Muellman. It's no secret that social media has forever changed the way our society operates both personally and professionally, but how often does one think about the legal implications of what we do online? South African attorneys Emma Sadlier and Tamsin De Beer offer their insights into the matter in their new book, Don't Film Yourself Having Sex, and other legal advice for the age of social media. Emma could unfortunately not be with us today, but Tamsin joins me now to discuss the many ways ordinary people, like yourselves, can get into some serious legal trouble at the click of a button. Tamsin, while the title of the book does offer some sage advice, um, it only skims the surface of the many caveats that you and Emma um, have gathered in this book. What are some of the basic tenets that you wanted to cover? Well, people think that uh, the title is really just a catchy one to try and get people's attention. But it actually is very good legal advice and it's based on a real case that we had to deal with in South Africa um, of revenge porn. Now, we find in our professional lives that we get calls all the time about people being victims of revenge porn, be it a form of themselves having sex or a picture of themselves taken without their clothes on, landing up online without their consent. And unfortunately, while laws exist to potentially help you, oftentimes using these legal processes shines a brighter spotlight on the content. And so practically, there's often not a real way to get this content taken down. And so flowing from that, we realized that there was this desperate ignorance around your rights, around what you put on social media, and what trouble you could get into, be that legal trouble or be that trouble with, at your job, being fired, um, children being expelled from school. And what we've attempted to do in the book is really collate all the laws and all the practical advice, all the disciplinary procedures um, into a useful guide that everyone who engages on social media in any capacity we think needs to read. What we've done is we've split it into four useful sections. So we've got the first section that really deals with the law. So issues like defamation and privacy and intellectual property and how those laws operate within the realms of the social media space. Then we have a whole section dedicated to sort of the common sense advice. Um, not filming yourself having sex, issues of revenge porn, um, also issues like online safety and interesting questions like what happens to your accounts when you die. We then have a whole section dedicated to children, which is the, the part of our job that I think Emma and I feel most passionate about in terms of protecting children around issues of cyberbullying and sexting in, a, in, a, in the context of children. And then, of course, we have a section dedicated to business, from the hiring stage to the firing stage, how social media can impact on the way businesses operate, how employees are managed, and how to get around and, and properly manage the voice on social media of a particular company. Um, so that's really everything that it covers uh, in a nutshell. Um, uh, and like I say, it's really just a, a collation of everything that, that can be applied in the space. Legal speak can be very tedious, but you guys managed to keep the book light and fun and witty, yet still very informative. What target market did you have in mind when writing the book? Well, we made a very conscious decision that we wanted this to be a book that every everyday layman would read. We didn't want it to be a legal textbook. And so we, we made the decision to keep it very easy, to keep it a very easy read, um, quite lighthearted, and we've attempted to be humorous, although we are lawyers, so we're not sure if we were successful. But it really is, um, it's aimed at everyone you, from eight to 80, because social media crosses all demographics in the digital age. So we're dealing with children of 9, 10, 11 having smartphones, and we're also dealing with grandmothers coming to grip with Facebook. We're dealing with CEOs who, even if they are not on social media themselves, are hiring people of 1920 who operate on these platforms. So social media we've seen in the last 10 years, and that's really wild that it's only been in the last 10 years, we've seen it sort of emerge as a fundamental, uh, we've seen emerge this fundamental shift in the way that we communicate. So it's, it's really pitched at everyone who operates on these platforms and anyone who deals with anyone who operates on these platforms. But it is, it's quite lighthearted and it's supposed to be a fun read. And we've really tried to uh, break these quite complex legal principles down into uh, uh, easy speak that everyone can understand. The book also discusses online defamation in detail. Can you elaborate on this? Well, what we've seen emerge over the last couple of years is this idea that people can hide behind a screen and this veneer of anonymity 
and go online and, and, and say things that perhaps they wouldn't be willing to say um, in real life. We've also seen um, with social media emerge a misconception about the extent to which the right to freedom of expression applies. And so I think that we've seen people um, think that they have this right to freedom of expression, they're given this wonderful platform with which to exercise that right, and therefore they can say whatever they want. What people need to remember is that the right to freedom of expression is not absolute, it's not unlimited, and we constantly need to balance that right against other rights, the right to dignity, the right to privacy. So when we deal with, uh, with uh, sort of Facebook defamation, Twitter defamation, it's any content that lowers someone else's reputation in the eyes of a third party. And we've seen numerous high court cases in South Africa of people who have uh, been found guilty of defaming someone um, uh, on Facebook and on other social media platforms. And I, it, it stems from this idea that what we used to say around the water cooler and around the dinner table has really shifted onto these public permanent platforms. And so perhaps you might have defamed someone in a private social context around the water cooler before. It oftentimes slipped through the cracks because no one will have picked up on it and no one really took the matter further. Whereas now that conversation is happening online where it uh, can be stored for evidence, it's public, it's permanent, and it goes viral so quickly. And so that's why I think we've seen this, the emergence of these cases. One thing you also emphasize is that tweets and Facebook updates are often not contextualized, which means that trying to have a sense of humor online can sometimes um, cause you to fall into hot water. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, we've seen many cases of uh, jokes falling flat, really, on, on social media. And it's exactly right what you say. As soon as something goes into digital format, it loses all tone and all context. You also lose control over your audience. What that means is that while it might be aimed at a small group of friends on Facebook, as soon as someone takes a screenshot and puts it on Twitter, it's all of a sudden all over the world. There really cannot be um, any sense of privacy on social media. If you wouldn't be willing for the whole world to see it, it shouldn't be going on there. So yes, absolutely, context is lost. One of the um, sort of the primary cases dealing with jokes falling flat on social media was a couple of years ago in the UK, a guy called Paul Chambers, who joked that the airport that he was waiting at to catch a flight that had been shut down because of bad weather, joked that he was going to blow it up. He, um, and he was arrested, he lost his job, and he faced a three-year legal battle fighting to clear his name on terrorism charges. Now, to you and I, it seemed obvious that that was a joke. But because of that loss of context, the loss of tone, um, he was arrested and he, and he faced this terrible legal battle to clear his name. So we actually have a whole chapter in the book called Don't Joke About Bombs, which is really just to explain to people that you've got to be very careful because what is a joke to you may not be a joke to someone else. Part four of the book is titled The Business Bit, which is pertinent to many of our viewers. What would you say those operating in the corporate world need to remember about social media? I think the primary thing that people need to remember is that the voice on social media is incredibly loud. What that means is that you really need to train whoever is um, in charge of managing the company's voice on social media in terms of the official presence, in terms of how to use that platform correctly and how not to get it wrong. We've had cases, uh, for example, of FNB recently coming out with, an, uh, with a tweet about how Steve, their ambassador for their advertising campaign, someone had asked, where's Steve gone? And, and the official account of FNB tweeted, he's somewhere in Afghanistan putting a bomb under a bus and telling the cripple to run for it. Now that was headline news all over the country that night. So we really need to see companies take cognizance of the fact that they need to start training whoever is in charge of their account as to how to get it right from a tonal perspective and legally. What's also important for companies to remember is that each employee that they have is an ambassador for that company online. When we, deal, when we deal with the online environment, it's so easy to draw a connection between an employee and an employer. Everyone has a LinkedIn profile, perhaps they put it on their Facebook page. And so it's so easy for an employee, by virtue of what they say online, to bring their company into disrepute, to breach the duty of good faith, and to do very serious reputational damage to a company's name and brand. And so I think those are really, if anything, the two key issues that companies should bear in mind. In the book, you mentioned that online disclaimers, such as stating that your views are your own, doesn't necessarily prevent you from still getting in into some serious trouble. Can you explain this? Yes, we've seen the, the emergence of these sort of disclaimers that say, um, 
my views are not uh, my views are not those of my employer. I'm I'm sort of tweeting in my personal capacity. Now I don't think that there's anything there's a, there's such a thing as personal capacity online, and I think people use these disclaimers to really they treat it like a magic wand that is going to save them from any trouble that they might get into with their employer. And that's absolutely not the case. As soon as an employee can be associated with a the company, they have the ability to uh, bring the name of that company into disrepute. And in some ways, that disclaimer makes the association with the company so much more obvious. Because you're saying, I work for X, but I, my views are not that of my employer. And so we would say, Use them if you want, although we do not encourage it. But if you do, don't treat it like a legal disclaimer. Rather treat it like an editorial comment um, and, and definitely don't think that it's going to get you off the hook. From the many examples that you bring up in the book, I've gathered that the UK seems to be a front runner in terms of social media law enforcement. Uh, do you agree? And would you say that South Africa has a lot to learn in this regard? Yes, well, we've got... Um, very many examples of the book. We've really tried to dot it with practical examples that people can take um, take heed of, and many of those examples do come from the UK. The reason for that is, I think the UK went through a period where they were they came out very strongly against any kind of objectionable content that was posted online. I think a year or two ago, they realised that they'd perhaps been a little bit heavy-handed in that regard. And the prosecuting authority in the UK has since come out with guidelines saying that, you know, we've actually got to start taking people's intention and issues of how digital communications differ from, um, from offline communications into account when we prosecute these, prosecute these cases. But it's an interesting way in which we can see that the law constantly really tries to grapple with how to deal with, um, with cases of online defamation and harassment and things like that. The UK has been has been uh, has led in that regard in terms of issuing these guidelines, and I think that we would certainly benefit from getting a little bit more guidance from our regulators in terms of how these communications will be dealt with, even in the context of something like tweeting from court, where we've got no guidance from the judiciary in terms of when it will be allowed, what people are allowed to say, and so we we would encourage that, that those sort of in in the regulator role sort of guide people and we've hoped that this book can guide them in a way but th it really needs to come from the top as well. Now without revealing too much what is one of your favorite anecdotes that you've included in the book? Well there's so many and some of them are really funny but I think um, one of the ones that we can take so much um, so much guidance from in terms of how harmful this content can be was a recent case um, in April of this year of a South African woman who went on her private Facebook page um, after having been in an accident with a taxi, she posted pictures of her car with, this, with the caption um, where she referenced the K-word and, and said that you know these taxi drivers don't deserve to live and they're complete savages. Now, interestingly, it was on a private Facebook page, but as I said, there's no such thing as privacy online. Someone took a screenshot of that and it went viral all over Twitter. What was very interesting is that we saw the emergence of what we call this digital vigilante mob in terms of people online who found out who this woman was, typed her name into Google and found out who she worked for, they then threatened to boycott that company until she was fired. And so, you know, for your viewers, obviously in a business context, that's very interesting and in that you see how quickly what people, what employees are saying online can have real world financial, uh, a real world financial impact on a company. And that's um, a crazy notion and something that we've seen emerge over the last couple of years. Tamsin, where do you think the future lies for digital technology and the law? Well, I think that it will always be difficult because this technology just moves so incredibly quickly. So it's very difficult for the law to legislate, to, uh, to, to regulate these technologies by legislation be just because the legislative process is so long. So by the time it's got, it's got come into law, we, we're, we're on to the next platform. And so I think that we really need to go on sort of an educational drive. I think that's the key, in that we need to educate people that the laws that exist at this time that have been developed over hundreds of years, laws of privacy, defamation, apply in exactly the same way to your online content as it, online content as it does offline. So particularly with children, we really need to educate people as opposed to change the law. Of course, we've seen some wonderful legislative developments in this area, particularly being the Protection from Harassment Act, which is really um, 
a good example of the, the legislation coming in to protect children and to protect people from online harassment. So it's a bit of a balancing act, a bit of a, a mixture between legislating for it, also self-regulation on these platforms of people really calling out uh, content that they don't think is acceptable, and then education on how to use the tools responsibly. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks Tamsin. for having me. That was Tamsin De Beer, co-author of the new book on social media law, Don't Film Yourself Having Sex.